Okay, so we have today our last uh, session in this mini series on on Italian Italian theory uh, or contemporary Italian Italian thought. And in previous session, we have had uh, really good interlocutors. I feel right. We we started with Rodrigo Carmi, uh, followed by Philippe Teofanidis. And last session, we, we, we engaged with Francesco Huercio and Federico de la Sala from Archaeologia Philosophica, uh, who, who sadly couldn't be here, but, but Felipe is here. And Rodrigo Carmi told me that his, his uh, seminar in Chile just started. So, so he, unfortunately, he cannot be here. Um, but this, but this uh, intervention today uh, by our fourth uh, speaker is by, by, by our colleague and friend, uh, Idris Robinson. Um, and Idris uh, is a, is completing his uh, his doctoral studies at the University of New Mexico, and he also works on contemporary Italian theory, mainly the the work of uh, Giorgio Agamben, and the uh, not very well known philosophy of um, the very interesting and fascinating thinker Enzo Malendri, who's going to be the topic of discussion today. Uh, Idris' writing can be read. Uh, and if I'm missing anything, just also let me know. Uh, but I think interest writing can be read in at, at it, it will um, publication, uh, Lundi Matin in France, or in French, I'm sorry. Uh, there is a forthcoming issue at the South uh, Atlantic Quarterly on the Stitching Power that he has uh, co-edited. And most recently, and I do, I, I very much recommend this, that there is a, uh, there is a new uh, dossier or special issue at the English journal Ed Notes on the hot summer of 2020, uh, two years after the assassination of George Floyd. Uh, and Idris Robinson wrote uh, a very provocative and very good piece there um, about, about that insurrection. But like I said, today we're going to hear Idris talk about um, Enzo Melandri and, and his, his work on, on philosophy. Uh, but as we have done in, with the other speakers, uh, we, can, we can pick up on, on other topics and themes that have been developing in, in, this, in this series um, within the frame of Italian theory. And, um, and again, it will, it's going to be a, ple a pleasure to, to speak with Idris. So thank you, Idris, and I'll, I'll pass you the, the, the mic. I oh, appreciate it, appreciate it. Um, so today I'm gonna to give like a very rough introduction to the extremely rich thought of the Italian philosopher Enzo Melandri, right? I'm just gonna to try to cover a few important aspects. Uh, before going on, I wanna give a few shout outs and big ups, you know. First, thank you to you, Gerardo, for, uh, for organizing this month long series on Italian thought. Uh, it's been great. Um, also, and all this is not empty academic praise. I wanna say I'm, I'm seriously honored to be uh, uh, for you to ask me to come along in the seminar. And, you know, on the 15th, uh, Felipe Theopandis gave an excellent talk on the subject of Communita, so to be included along with him. And um, on the 8th, Rodrigo Carmi gave a, a, a talk which um, in Spanish, and I definitely consider him one of the most exciting thinkers uh, doing it today. So I'm just honored to be here. Um, so let's get into Melandri himself, all right? And you'll notice the suprematist kind of paintings in the background will actually be somewhat thematically relevant as time goes on, all right? So first, uh, just talking about Melandri himself, he was born in Genoa in 1926. He unfortunately passed away at the age of 67 in 1993. Um, since Melandri is virtually unknown outside of Italy, the aim of my talk today is really just to generate more interest in his life and his thought. Hence, you know, there'll be some biographical details that I'm gonna be giving along the way. But in fact, he's not really that well known in Italy either. And indeed, if there's any awareness of Melandri, it's probably or likely due to Giorgio Agamben, due to Giorgio Agamben's popularization. Um, as indicated on the screen, you'll see uh, Agamben doesn't hold back in his praise of Melandri. And this is a quote we've seen come up a few, you could see it, uh, he's used it in quite a few places, but he said something like uh, Gianni Carcia, Giorgio Coli, Furio Yesi and Enzo Melandri are the few names that count in the register of Italian thought in the last 30 years, all right? I think that quote was made around 2004, all right? Um, so he really holds him in high regard and uh, for different reasons, I think each of these thinkers need to be engaged with in their own right. 
Um, in the direction of popularizing Melanchthon's work, Agamben has been republishing uh, a lot of these texts out of his uh, you know, publishing venture known as Quote Libet. Um, him and Stefano Bassani, I believe, who was a um, Melandri student, worked on putting out a 2004 version of uh, Melandri's magnum opus, uh, Line and Circle. In the English-speaking world, if there's some awareness of Melandri, it's going to be due to uh, Agamben's references to Melandri in the signature of all things, right? He relies very heavily on Melandri in that text and cites him quite often. Um, however, it would be wrong to understand Melandry's importance strictly in terms of clarificatory exposition in terms of a Gambit scholarship. So in fact, the reason why Melandry figures so decisively, I think, into the signature of all things, uh, into Gambit's text, the signature of all things, is because it's a text devoted to philosophical methodology. And accordingly, we can understand the true value of Melandry's contributions must be grasped within the wider scope of logic and morphology, all right? so. Um, I consider both logic and morphology the two philosophical methods par excellence, and this is where uh, Melandry is really going to be helpful to understanding how do we go forth in terms of method and procedure of thought. Um, it would be uh, better then, or just as well, to consider Melandry as uh, instead of just alongside of Agamben or someone that Agamben draws on, to consider him on, alongside the founder of the discipline of logic itself, that is in dialogue with none other than Aristotle. Um, so we should credit Melandry with promoting analogical reasoning to the heights that are often conferred to other forms of logic like deductive or its inductive counterparts. Likewise, we should also situate Melandry uh, in a lineage that can be traced back to the founder of morphology. So I'm going to actually situate him a lot next to Frege, um, understand him in terms of Aristotle, and also with Goethe. All right, we're going to think of Goethe's scientific method as something that Melandry can help us better understand. Um, let's move on a little bit here. So before I go on, I also want to give a shout out. Last one, I swear, is to Angelo Bonfani. Um, Anyone's interested in learning more about Melandry, he wrote what I think is hands down the best study of Melandry. And I was saying, Gerardo, uh, you know, um, line and circle, or only Melandry text that's been translated is a small article, I want to say maybe a 10 page article on Brentano's interpretation of Aristotle's logic and, uh, and it, or Brentano's interpretation of Aristotle's uh, theory of categories, right? And it's a very short, very dense, difficult article. And um, so we don't have much of Melandry at all in English. And alongside probably the translation of, say, line and circle, I really want to push for a translation of the form of analogy by uh, Angelo Bonfani that came out in 2016 on an Italian, publish an Italian publishing house called Arcane. In fact, this was his, I actually read his uh, doctoral dissertation, which was the blueprint for this book. And it, it hands down is probably, or at least one of the most insightful and comprehensive doctoral dissertations I've ever read, right? And if, if everyone worked like this on their dissertations, we'd have complete access to the truth by now. So um, I'd like to add also that Bonfani, is a, he's a friend of the working class. I've been in correspondence with him. So he deserves a shout out for that as well, right? He's uh, on the side of the people in the proletariat. Um, so Bonfani's work is also, I want to probably like 99% of what I know about Melandry's work, he's responsible for and clarifying it, right? Um, that's how important his dissertation is to me. So uh, pushing for that translation as well. Now let's get into Melandry. Like I said, uh, the main thrust of Melandry's theoret theoretical contribution can be metaphorically encapsulated in the title of his 1968 magnum opus, which uh, which be translated as linea, uh, you know, as line and circle, okay? And line and circle are gonna serve as two important metaphors that allow me structure what I say today or most of this talk, all right? So, and, and again, this hasn't been translated and needs to be translated. Uh, on the one hand, we have line, all right? As you see in this primitive work, you have a line. And on the other hand, you have a circle, all right? There you go. Each is gonna represent two opposing yet complementary approaches to logic, all right? Line represents one way of doing logic and circle represents another way of doing logic, all right? Line is gonna represent what we could take to be something of the standard, widely accepted, 
rules of pattern, rules, patterns, and models of inference, all right? So um, Melandry is gonna quote unquote elaborate this linear mode of logic, both historically and intersystematically in line and circle, all right? So he's gonna give you a survey of the history of this linear approach to logic, and he's also gonna break into the system of it and show you the ins and outs of it, right? The internal pressures and tensions that exist within uh, each of these historical forms of logic, all right? So we can start to think of this or the linear mode of logic in terms of Aristotle's codification of logic in his organum, right? And we should remember that Aristotle does give, uh, he mentions analogical inference. He does give some lip service to circle, right? He talks about analogical inferences, but the way that the codification of logic in the organum has been bequeathed to us this is often overlooked, right? Uh, what we actually inherit from the Staggerite is, you know, is a set of accepted patterns of deductive syllogisms and inductive extrapolations, right? We think of Aristotle's logic, we don't typically think of analogy. We think of, you know, him being the first to kind of codify the, the various forms of, anal of um, sorry, inductive and deductive reasoning that's there in Plato, but Plato never steps back and says, okay, this is what we're doing, all right? Uh, and when this is received, all right, it, it's going to be received mainly in the deductive and inductive forms. But analogical reason is both there in both of the Greeks. All right? <laughs> Similarly, with St. Thomas Aquinas, the prime example of a philosopher in the Middle Ages, he does give lip service to analogy too. All right, there are you know there's pages devoted to uh, analogy in Aquinas's corpus. However, the overall drift of the Middle Ages is going to involve a systematization of Aristotle's catalog of syllogisms, right? These are gonna be given supremacy. These are gonna be uh, uh, endorsed as the most important. Hence, you know, we get the major figures, which no one learns today, of the Barbara, right? The Barbara syllogism, the major forms of whether the Barbara, the Salanti, the Dari, and the Ferio, the Barbara is all X is Y, right? All, all, all. Um, these are going to be what we really take away are these kind of linear approaches to logic, these standard approaches to logic. Um, the main breakthrough of formal symbolic or mathematical logic right at the turn of the 19th century and the early 20th century is going to be the apex of this tendency of this linear mode of logic. All right. And linear is really just a metaphor here. It's not linear in the sense that we're speaking of, you know, uh, first this, then that, but linear in the sense that it's so rigid and, uh, uh, and systematic. But with Frege and Russell, we get a calculus of logic, right, that aims at rigorous inference. And this rigor, and by trying to insert this sort of rigor into logic, right, they have a, mo a various operations that demand the regimentation of language. So such that all ordinary discourse for uh, Frege especially is going to be dismissed as unscientific, right? He's going to banish ordinary modes of discourse from logic. He's going to banish also uh, um, uh, artistic and poetic modes of discourse. He says this explicitly, right? This just can't get past his uh, requirement for the determinacy of sense. And such a regimentation is also going to entail that analogical modes of discourse and reasoning are utterly excluded from the domain of logic once Frege and Russell come along, all right? And their system is, of course, going to have a wide breadth of influence. You know, it's... it's um, you know, we can't, uh, uh, we can't dismiss how important their contributions are, but, you know, uh, these kind of their contributions in, in uh, inserting this kind of rigor and, you know, the ability to mathematically, uh, to use mathematical, uh, to model mathematical forms of reasoning with logic are also going to have its downsides too, all right? Uh, on the flip side, from the standard kind of formal kind of logic, we have another heterodox logic, the logic of analogy. And this is what is going to be the main focus of Melandry's work, all right? So I'm going to refer to it as kind of this subterranean movement of anal analogy, right? And this is going to oppose in every instance the reified systematization of thought. Um, every time, according to Melandry, and you know, Melandry does a long historical study of this, that wherever you have these rigid forms of logic, whether in the ancient, medieval, or modern period, you also have its analogical counterpoint that's more free. All right? uh, and what's interesting is that Melandry is going to explain this. You know, he's not just an analytic thinker; he's one of the few thinkers that I think does both an analytic and continental, or Anglo-American continental mix very well. Is that he explains this kind of repression of analogy uh, as a kind of, and, and its return as a return of the repressed Freudian terms. 
He's also one of, going to be one of the early popularizers of Foucault's archaeology of knowledge. He's also going to explain analogy in that in those terms as well. Um, so whenever logic goes too far into the pretenses of rigor and systemization, analogy shows itself as the force that can overcome these rigid boundaries that are so, in some degree artificially imposed upon it. Um, he conceives of line and circle then as two conflicting and yet independent logics, all right? So, uh, and each, both line and circle, standard logic and logic of analogy have their own autonomous principles, yet as much as they come into conflict with each other, as, well, as much as you have this kind of rigid form of formal logic and this very free <laughs> Oh, it's okay. <laughs> as long as you have this free kind of uh, uh, anal uh, logic of analogy, and they come into conflict and they challenge each other. On the other hand, they also complement each other. All right. Uh, so to say the shortcomings of standard logic can be alleviated by the free forms of analogy, and free forms of analogy at times may need to be tied down by the more uh, rigid forms of standard logic. Okay. Um, I want to stress too that. For Melandry, and at times I think he slips, and I think this is a problem of expression in the fact that analogy has been so uh, uh, repressed, but also times uh, it's also the fact that you know, commentators just make a mistake here, right? That both analogy and the old logic, or both analogy and the rigid forms of logic are both to be considered logical and rational, all right? Uh, and I wanna keep pushing on this that we need to make sure that we consider analogy to be just as logical and just as rational as say deduction or induction, all right? Uh, the idea or the uh, or what I wanna take from him, and I really, what I, what I, I'm not thinking I'm reading this into him, what I take Melandry to be doing is to show that uh, analogy is just as important to thinking and thought as deduction is or anything else, all right? Um, and I think commentators tend to miss this at points. In fact, this is going to be one of the main contentions of my dissertation on Wittgenstein is that when Wittgenstein moves into his later phase and he comes to realize that analogical reasoning with regards to similarity and difference are just as legitimate, he's going to re recognize that analogical re reasoning with regards to similarity and difference, you know, uh, different forms of comparison and contrast are going to be just as legitimate as the symbolic logic that he inherited from Frege and Russell. All right. So analogy is just as important as uh, the other kinds of logic that say we learn. And uh, my students used to learn it. I, I learned, began to learn logic in, um, in uh, high school, but now I think it usually starts typically in the States, at least in the first year of undergrad. Uh, so in fact, what Wittgenstein also argues is that in order for logic to achieve its purposes, its aims of clarification, it must rely on analogy just as much as it does symbolic uh, deduction. So analogy and symbolic deduction are going to work together to give you, to give logic the clarificatory purposes that it aims at and that it wants to achieve. All right. Next up, we have line and circle. The next one on the list is line versus circle. Okay. Uh, Line versus circle. All right. So you have, you know, standard logic versus analogical logic, right? Uh, standard reasoning versus analogical reasoning, reasoning. Okay. So we can grasp this difference between or this distinction between line and circle, between the standard logic and the logical analogy, between by or comparing and contrasting the two columns that I've listed for you guys here. All right. Um, on the left, you'll see many of the principles and laws of logic that you're more than likely familiar with, all right? But on the right, they have, uh, uh, we have their analogical opposites posited by Melandry, all right? So for each law or principle or, you know, uh, or, require, or logical requirement that is typically posited within the standard logic, uh, you know, the circle complement is what Melandry is going to posit as its analogical opposite, all right? Uh, in other words, analogy is going to contravene the accepted and received laws and principles of logic. But however, by vitiating these laws, analogy isn't going to throw them away, but it's going to augment precisely what the standard laws of logic can't handle or treat. Okay. And um, once again, and for this reason, line and circle deduction analogy should be considered as both logical and both complementary, all right? And if you go through the list, you'll see, you know, the law of identity, 
has the functional principle of identity, the law of non-contradiction, but on the other side, analogy admits contradiction, uh, the law of excluded middle, in analogy, we can include the middle, intention versus extension, uh, discreteness versus continuity, univocity of meaning versus the equivocity or the plurivocity of meaning. All right. There, these are it's our two sides that are opposing each other. All right. And we can get an idea of what Melangi is trying to do with analogy by studying each of these laws or requirements. Okay. Um, let's start with the law of identity, which he calls the law of elementary identity. All right. And you'll see why he calls it this. All right. So this law has classically been deemed one of the, the, the it's been deemed the first of the three main laws of logic. All right. Uh, the three laws of logic are law of identity, law of non-contradiction, and law of excluded middle or law of excluded third. All right. The first one being the law of identity. Um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. It maintains that each thing is identical with itself, all right? You know, there's Leibniz's formulation, Frank's Frege's formulation. Uh, what they want to say or what everyone wants to say who upholds this uh, law of thought is that given a thing A, A is variably the same or identical with A itself, all right? A equals A, all right? Simple as can be, right? Uh, and of course, the law of identity is going to be readily accepted as something that's very obvious or a self-evident truth. And for this reason, Melandry isn't necessarily going to doubt this law or dismiss its validity, but instead he's going to work towards a kind of internal criticism of it, of it that shows that its unquestioned authority or unquestioned, uh, uh, or unquestioned supremacy, you know, can't maintain what, uh, uh, can't stand the test, right? He's going to critique this unquestioned authority that the law of identity holds. Now, for instance, Melandry notes that even in Aristotle, so if you go back to the first articulation, the classic articulation of the law of identity, that Aristotle admits there are three other formulations of identity. So there's four, right, for Aristotle. There's the law of identity that we all know and we all talk about and that's you know, been passed down through the ages. But if we look closely and when he discussed the topic, he, talks, he speaks of three other kinds of Aristotle. So what's more is that the correct application of the law is going to demand certain logical linguistic requirements be imposed and certain particular uh, ontological presuppositions must be assumed, right? So there's going to be only, there is a particular context in which the law of identity can be validly applied. And this requires that certain logical requirements are, are put into play and certain ontological requirements are put into play, all right? Without these logical requirements, we're gonna see that we, we have to look to something besides the classical articulation of the law of identity. So for starters, the main uh, logical requirement that must be in play or must be taken for granted in order for the law of identity to, to, to work and to be valid is the university of meaning. All right, so it's the bottom of the university of meaning. That is to say, if we allowed A, say the term A, any term A within the language system, the liberty to take on the variety of meanings uh, that other terms in ordinary discourse do, then A would not always equal A, okay? Now I'll stop there. What do I mean by this? What I'm trying to say is this, right? That, you know, when we speak um, normally to one another, you know, uh, one word can mean many different things, all right? Uh, um, you know, and, and Wittgenstein, his favorite examples of this were like, you know, the sentence green is green. In the first uh, instance of green and the sentence green is green, it's being used as a noun. And in the second instance, it's being used as an adjective, right? Or is, right? Is, he always says, was the main uh, flaw of metaphysics that is typically is used with two meanings, right? Is can mean with a transitive verb of existing or it can be used as a copula, right? Um, you know, and when we speak, this is why there's ambiguity, right? When we talk to each other, you know, this is why we ask someone when he, someone makes a claim, we're like, well, what do you mean by this word? What do you mean by A, right? Um, specifically with uh, the logic, the, uh, the uh, specifically with modern formal logic, you know, one of the big claims to its rigor is that it's going to exclude all forms of meaning that have any, uh, um, that can drift into equivocity, right? A is always going to stand for one particular object, all right? So, and when A stands for one particular object, of course, A does equal A, but, you know, if the meaning of A can slip, A is not always going to equal A, all right? Usually I stop now, I would stop and be like, is that clear to you guys? Right now it's getting a little bit technical um, when I teach a class, but anyway. 
Uh, also for A to equal A or for A, the law of identity to hold for A to equal A or for A to be the same as A, we have to maintain that the thing that A stands for is a discrete and elemental atom, right? And this is a, a important ontological requirement that needs to be in place in order for the law of identity to hold. If A had the capacity to blend with other things, right? If there are reasons where, or, or cases in which, you know, A will border on B such that it'll have a blend of both A and B, then in those cases where we don't have these stark divisions uh, that separate things from one another, then we don't have a case in which A would equal A, right? So if things admit a certain blending or fusion with other things, the law of identity isn't going to hold either, all right? All of these linguistic, logical, and ontological presuppositions are going to come to their apogee with the formal logic of Frege, Russell, and Wittgenstein, right? And I think uh, you got a little bit of that in uh, the text that uh, Gerardo shared with you, right? Gerardo shared um, Contra Symbolico on the, the first chapter. Melendrick is going to go into great detail to put forward how all these aspects, uh, all these logical requirements are necessary in order for the Fragian or the Russell or the Russellian system of logic to get off the ground, all right? In fact, the early Wittgenstein is gonna hold that these requirements are so implicit that the law of identity cannot even be articulated, right? Wittgenstein's famous claim against both Frege and Russell is that, you know, that you can't even articulate or say the law of identity. It's going to be shown, all right? So um, you don't need to articulate it because you don't even have to, all right? We, don't have, we can't articulate it because it's not necessary. If all the logical and ontological requirements are in place, the law of identity is gonna show itself by us using the same word in the same way or by a thing being a thing unto itself, all right? Now, the flip side of this is going to be what, can be called the alternative functional or proportional or uh, analogical principle of identity, all right? And Melandry's argument is simply gonna be that, is that if we do not necessarily always abide by the philosophical requirements, right? The logical, linguistic, or the ontological requirements accepted to get the system off the ground, then we must admit other kinds of identity, all right? That is to say, right, if there other kinds of valid structural or formal identity that can come about. You know, there are other forms of valid, of valid structural or functional or formal identity that can be come into play when we give up some of these requirements. All right. Um, so, for example, Melandry states the quote. Uh, I'm going to quote Melandry here. He states, "Quote the unity according to analogy is to say that an atom is." in a chemical compound is much like a person is a social aggregate, right? And we all understand what that means, right? Uh, atom in a chemical compound is like a person in a, 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 is like a person in a wider social aggregate, right? This isn't nonsensical to us. We get what this means and we're using a kind of looser form of identity here. And it has some validity, right? It explains, uh, you know, say, um, we could use it to begin a critique of the at, of an atomized individual, right? Uh, in um, in social theory, right? Marx might want to use this to get um, the critique of alienation off the ground. All right. So uh, what Melandry is putting forward is that there's kinds of a did uh, uh, there there the kind of identity that we can validly employ is going to be relative to the context of its application. In certain senses, you know, we're going to want to use different forms of identity in order to get up for different points and they're no less valid, all right? Hence, Melandry also asserts that um, there exist structural and relational forms of identity that will occur not just say between two things, but identity can have, um, you know, uh, understanding that's very relational in the sense that we can identify two nodes, say, one node and one structural background in another in another context of a structural background and show that due to their relation to their structural backgrounds there's an identity between the two all right so it's not going to be a list of say all the properties of a are the same as all the properties of this other a but to show that in certain cases we need to do we need to rely on forms of identity that work with the backdrop of the context itself right to show that there's relational identity here um, and once again, it's important to, to argue or it's important to remember that one form of identity is not better than the other. Each can be used to widen the task of clarification in different ways, depending on where we're working, what kind of uh, system we're working in or what kind of question we're addressing, et cetera, et cetera.
All right. So we have one kind of identity, another, and we also have, you know, uh, he's going to also, and I think this is his key breakthrough for um, Landry's key theoretical breakthrough here is going to be a subversion of both the law of non-contradiction and the law of excluded middle. All right. Uh, he's going to admit contradictions and he's going to include the third or include the middle. All right. Um, now, in uh, the 20th century, we have tons of, uh, we, well, not tons, all right, that's not true, but in the 20th century, analytic philosophy does have some precursors to this, right? The law of non-contradiction had already been famously challenged by the Polish uh, logician Lukashevitz, right? It's written Lukashevitz, but uh, it's pronounced Lukashevitz from what I understand. More recently, um, Graham Priest has done well in popularizing the acceptance of contradiction with his work on paraconsistent logic and dialectic ontology. Um, also, uh, you know, it's important to know just because we're we keep touching on the political content of this work. Graham Priest is, from what I understand, and you know, he's written about Marx and he's a committed communist. Uh, likewise, the intuitionist mathematician, uh, intuitionist mathematics, such as what was proposed by the Dutch communist mathematician Brewer, right? Brewer was also a communist, already served to contest the supremacy of the law of excluded middle early in the 20th century logic, right? And uh, working on the intention program, uh, um, Brewer was to say, was to throw out the law of excluded middle as well, all right? Um, one day it'll be a, it would be interesting to tie together all these communists who uh, have an interest in overthrowing the law of non-contradiction or the law of excluded middle. Um, and there's a great, and kind of going off topic, but there's a great Wittgenstein line uh, that, and he takes out Brewer in this, but he says, you know, Ramsey is a bourgeois logician and he's contrasting him with Brewer who's considered like a proletarian logician, all right? Um, so we do have precedents for this, but what I think is really important about, uh, what is really important about Melandry is that not just simply overthrowing non-contradiction included middle, he has this kind of philosophical depth and an understanding of the history of philosophy that's, you know, that really supersedes all these people that I've mentioned before that enables him to do a lot more with this, right? When he uh, overthrows contradiction and non-contradiction into the middle, he's able to contextualize this in a broader historical drift, right? And take out and take in more philosophical resources from the history of philosophy to do things with this, right? Typically, when you hear people admitting contradictions, they just think Hegel, right? But, you know, uh, Melanchthon is going to be able to do much, much more than this, right? Um, and so it's this novel and unique direction that he takes the undermining of these laws that's really important here. Uh, so as it was with the law of identity, the laws of non-contradiction and the law on the laws on the law of excluded middle can only reign under certain assumptions, right? And these assumptions are the same ones that hold for the law of identity. You need, uh, you know, certain stark, clear-cut, and steadfast distinctions between things like P and not P or the propositions like P and not P, true and false, and A and B, all right? If you don't have these discrete, clear-cut, univocal distinctions, right, then these are cases, according to Melandry, where uh, the law of non-contradiction will fail and the law of excluded middle might fail as well, all right? So Melandry is going to insist that there are cases where instead of these steadfast, clear-cut breaks between, say, P and not P or true and false, we're gonna have certain continuities and certain continuous gradations between dichotomous contraries, right? So instead of saying that there's a stark li uh, law of contrariety between A and B, he's gonna say that in between these two, there's levels of gradation, all right? There's, you can admit a certain amount of, uh, uh, um, uh, of both, maybe both or neither, okay? So um, things don't have to be so clear cut and things aren't always so clear cut is what he's saying. Um, the best example of this is to just think of the contraries of black and white, all right? Uh, in logic, you know, in the old logic, just to have a, a dichotomy or contraries of black and white, you have something like not white and, and white, all right? Or not black and black. There's no, uh, there's nothing in between the two, right? You have this really powerful uh, exclusion of black and white, all right? They don't touch at all. Um, and, uh, you know, a good line to look at this is when um, uh, Hegel talks about um, determinate negation, right? He, he recognizes that, you know, this is just perfect, this just won't do, all right? There's, between black and white, there's gonna be a host of other colors in between, right? Uh, so Melanchthon's gonna observe that between black and white, there's an infinite series of continuous and 
intermediate chromatic gradations between two opposing colors, right? There could be various shades of gray, right? Or this could say that, you know, we have a, a, a color circle that emits red and blue, et cetera, et cetera. But say between black and white, we have all these various shades of gray, which I think is some novel or something like that, right? Uh, for my part, I think it's no coincidence. One day I'll get to this and saying this in a more, a more uh, thought out way that it's no coincidence that the early Wittgenstein is going to begin questioning the Tractatus on the basis of what has been called the color and compatibility problem, right? As the story goes, and I think this is basically in, you know, I mean, there's always, we always learn a little bit more about his time in between philosophy, but the story goes is that, you know, in the Tractatus, Wittgenstein held that, you know, a point being both blue and green is excluded by the logic of color. Ramsey, Frank Ramsey, Frank Plunton Ramsey, you know, actually visits uh, Wittgenstein in uh, rural Austria when he's teaching at a small school in a village, right? And says, hey, look, there's a mistake here. And Wittgenstein comes to admit that, yes, there's a mistake in, in the Tractatus, his pretensions of solving every philosophical problem, uh, you know, can no longer be held, and it all falls back to color, right? He comes to see that color needs to be understood in gradations of a wheel as well, all right? Um, Agamben also recognizes the value of how Melandry overturns kind of this hegemony of binary logic to include a third or a middle, all right? And this is where I think most of the people here will have uh, some familiarity with it, what, what um, Agamben precisely calls kind of he calls it either uh, a zone of indistinction, a zone of indifference, or a un zone of undecidability. When he's at his most rigorous in handling this concept, he's relying on Melandry here, right? He's going to say that there's an area of a threshold, right? And when he really wants to work well within this threshold, you know, to explain, say, uh, cases in which the state of exception is in play, where we're both inside and outside of uh, of the law in play, or this is the place where bare life resides, he's gonna use this kind of model of an included third to say, this is the threshold of the zone of indifference. Um, another thing that we should uh, mention is that Melanchthon's analysis of this kind of liminal domain of, of contradiction or included third or zone of indesignability is going to return to the Greek meaning of analogia, right? And he understands this, you know, as it was uh, during the early eight days of of math and logic and antiquity as a proportion of ratios, all right? And we don't have to get too much into this, but um, a proportion is just going to emit degrees of uh, dichotomous opposition. So we can think of the black and white example as a proportion of a bit of black and white, all right? And say in propositional logic, we can consider, can consider this as kind of a proportion of degrees of emitting both P and not P or true and false, or concept A and concept B, all right? He, uh, if you ever, if you're interested to look into Melandry, he, I, th I believe he was one of the translators of Irvin Kobe's textbook on logic, which you can find in any library in America, at least, right? It was a very standard textbook. So he uses concept A and B and says that there's kind of a mix of A and B, right? That's that's Irvin Kobe's example. Um, so what Melandry really gives us, at least why he became important to me initially is that he gives us a fully logical approach of dealing with this include a third or contradiction. And he's able to expand upon this much more. Sometimes I feel, you know, even when you look at say um, certain work in paraconsistent logic in the analytic tradition, they don't have much to say, right? But with, uh, with Melandry, he's gonna not just give us uh, a rigorous way of handling contradictions, but he's gonna give us a lot of depth and expand uh, what we can actually do with the contradiction as well. Let's see, next slide up. Now, I should go on to this. One of the applications of this deals a lot with my dissertation, what I'm working on now. Uh, um, that is to say, what I like to say is like, if there's a subterranean movement of analogy, right? You know, if Melandry is gonna explain that analogy is what, uh, as the repressed that always returns, right? In the same way, I conceive of morphology as this kind of subterranean current as well. It's an underground current, all right? And what do I mean by morphology here, all right? So I take morphology, I'm gonna work in the same way that Melandry does with the Greek. It's gonna be the logos of morphe, all right? Uh, the, uh, the logical investigation of forms, all right? And what I wanna argue is what, and, and I'll, of course I would need more time to do this, is that there's this kind of 
underground subterranean current of morphology that is this kind of heterodox form of Platonism that resurfaces again and again throughout the history of thought, all right? Um, the, when you speak of morphology, typically the starting point is going to be with Goethe's interventions into natural science, all right? The, the story uh, that Goethe recounts, if you look in, uh, you know, and I suggest everyone does read this, even not just for the philosophy of it, but because it's a beautiful piece of literature, is that when you read uh, Goethe's Italian journey, he speaks of going to Italy and investigating plants, and he comes to this, uh, he has this kind of aha moment where he comes across what he takes to be the herb plant, all right? And this is the beginning of his various studies in geology, anatomy, right? He talks about the maxillary bone uh, um, in color. He, he, just as much as Goethe was a poet, he really wanted his contribution to be his contribution to natural sciences, all right? Um, so, and in the same way that, you know, Goethe's German idealist milieu is resisting this kind of rigid, atomistic systematization uh, of the Newtonian model of science, right? And you see this with um, the way of reason overturns understanding in Hegel. Goethe's challenge is going to be carried out purely in the, in the realm of science for him. And he has another story where he gets a prism, he borrows it from his friend, and he sees that Newton, Newton is wrong in his theory of color, right? And, you know, he devotes a lot of time. And there's two works where he devotes um, uh, uh, himself to a very exhaustive analysis of the various ways that color shows up, right? And, you know, it looks much different from, you know, uh, how, um, you know, you have physical laws that are derived from basic principles. Instead, what Goethe does is give a description of the various ways that color interacts, the way color shows itself, et cetera, et cetera. And there's going to be a certain er phenomenon which allows him to derive different ways uh, that color presents itself in the same way that Goethe thinks of an er plant, right, uh, as what is the basis of all other plants, right? Goethe's claim in his botany is that just in the way that color, there's a basic color in which all colors can be derived, there's a basic leaf in which all plants can be derived. He calls this the primal plant or uh, the ur phenomenon or the archetype or the ur build, right? However you wanna, uh, however you wanna translate it. Um, often it gets translated as paradigm, okay? And um, Wittgenstein, when he overcomes this kind of logical atomism that I spoke earlier about when, you know, he comes back to philosophy after thinking he has solved everything, he's gonna read very closely Goethe, right? Uh, Ray Monk once told me that Goethe is the most cited uh, author in the Wittgenstein corpus not Frege, not Russell, but Goethe, right? And equally important uh, uh, with both Wittgenstein's philosophical outlook and to some degree, which is a little bit scary, his political and historical outlook, he reads Spengler, who relies very heavily on Goethe, right? We were talking about reactionary thought earlier. Um, uh, Wittgenstein reads The Decline of the West, which takes up the Goethean method in uh, uh, the realm of history. And in fact, um, you know, in Italy recently, a few scholars have been looking in, uh, looking into around the 20s and 30s. There's an explosion of the morphological method being used in various parts of humanities. Right? Benjamin is going to employ the morphological method in the Paris arcades. Right? You know, when he talks about the dialectological and the dialectical images that flashes up, he's working with Goethe's morphology here. Um, uh, Vladimir Prop in Russia in his um, in his breakthrough structural analysis of the folktale. He's relying on the morphological method. Um, you know, even in like archaeology, uh, I think it's Froebius uses morphology. So Wittgenstein can be understood as one of the many people uh, alongside Spengler and Benjamin who take up the morphological method, but he's going to apply this to problems of I, in my opinion, classic ontology and logic. Okay. So um Another thing I want to say that that uh, uh, I want another thing I want to just add into here is that you know Serge Ginsburg actually when he's when he's dealing with uh, you know his analysis or his historical recounting of sorry Carlo Ginsburg when he's dealing with his uh, Carlo is the is the son right I always get confused yeah Carlo Carlo okay in the, in the and uh, Carlo Levy is who he's named after right right is the the great Italian author thank you yeah. Same thing happens, uh, 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 um, at least Ginsburg is going to argue for the, uh, the idea of morphology as this kind of underground um, 
I have this underground uh, subterranean current as well. And, you know, in his studies of, say, um, heresy with the Benditani, right, the, the werewolves or um, the cheese and the worms, the Miller who engages in the heresy. And he sees these things keep popping up again and again in history and he can't explain why. And he figures out that cause and, uh, cause and effect analysis or, you know, very rigid modes of historical analysis don't work. He actually reads uh, Wittgenstein's critique of Fraser's Golden Bow, which is heavily influenced by both Spangler and Goethe, and he says, okay, this is how I can explain the recurrence of heresy and the recurrence of these, spe uh, of these specific forms of, say, even like a, a, a supernatural kind of occurrences throughout history. Why do werewolves keep popping up? Why do the same heresies keep popping up, right? And he's going to use the morphological method to say, okay, uh, these are certain forms of things that press themselves within uh, the, the unfolding of history, okay? Morphology is going to be the companion of analogical reasoning. Why? For a number of reasons, right? Um, for Wittgenstein, at least, we can keep formal logic. Formal logic has its place, right? But it needs to be understood as an er phenomenon or paradigm, all right? There are ways we can take uh, um, formal logic to clarify the language that we use and the language that we use when doing philosophy, right? But the slippery slope is reduce all language to formal logic, all right? So if we use formal logic as a paradigm, all right, it can be used as a clarificatory device, a device, clarificatory device, and at times when we don't need it, we can throw it away and we can use another form, all right? Um, and this is also going to mean in, in the realm of Wittgenstein scholarship that that you know, if we're going to throw away uh, formal logic and we're going to use it at times, if we're going to have to understand places where formal logic needs to work and where it doesn't work, uh, where an analogical reasoning should take the place of formal logic, then this has a host of ontological commitments as well. All right, so there's a tendency to read Wittgenstein uh, and rightly so to some degree as overturning classical ontology and questions of metaphysics. My argument uh, is going to be that implicitly by taking up paradigms and using paradigms in analogical reasoning, we get an understanding of an implicit ontology that's at work here, all right? What's more, uh, and, and this actually really pisses me off, uh, is there'll be times where the early Wittgenstein gets read as the height of logical rigor and the later Wittgenstein of the PI of the philosophical investigation gets read as it's kind of postmodern poetic use of language, right? But Wittgenstein tells us this again and again, all right? If you open the PI, the philosophical investigations at 108 and 242, he argues that, okay, it may look like logic is being abolished, but it's not. I'm not abolishing logic. I'm going further, I'm expanding logic to involve comparison and contrast, similarity and difference with various paradigms. So in, instead, I wanna argue that Wittgenstein is actually adding rigor to formal logic and expanding and deepening its scope, all right? Um, what else did I wanna say? Uh, morphology also is, I think, will is becoming you know, more and more popular in certain realms and I, I, it needs probably need to reconnect on a number of planes within the humanities and the sciences and logic. But um, recently in 2020, uh, two Italian philosophers put out a compendium, a glossary of morphology, a huge one. And this is gonna be a big breakthrough for, uh, for the study of morphology. Also, um, you know, we can understand paradigms, right? Uh, say paradigms in the sense of um, what Foucault talks about in archeology span or, um, uh, uh, you know, Kuhn's paradigms in science more rigorously as a Wittgensteinian paradigm. All right, uh, the standard meter example in, in PI 50 is what Wittgenstein calls a paradigm. And we have a logic now to work with these things. They won't dissolve into relativism. We have a, a rigorous logic that allows us to work with say scientific paradigms, say of new measurements, of new scientific readings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, lastly, um, back to Italian thought, uh, if you look into Agamben's homo soccer, right? The logic of what he calls whatever singularity is what he identifies with the logic of an example, right? And this is just another way of translating paradigm as well, all right? In the state of exception, when he compares the example 
to uh, the logic of the example, to the logic of the exception. He's relying again on the logic of paradigm, right? And then finally, in uh, his methodological text and signature things, paradigms come into view as well, all right? And this is all can be, uh, we can work better with this using uh, a kind of more rigorous logical morphology. Lastly, okay. So uh, I think Gerardo wanted me to talk about some of the political tie this into some politics. Do I have time for that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, all right. So um, one thing I should note is that Melandry also had uh, political commitments and to some degree he was a fellow traveler and to some degrees he was just a traveler, right? He was a comrade. Uh, in 68, Melandry publishes Line and Circle and he sees it as kind of a way of overturning a certain supremacy of certain forms of reasoning, right? So it is an, it's, it's an attack on a particular mindset as well, all right? Uh, and he has more practical kind of uh, interventions he makes too. Uh, he writes for a militant magazine in the 60s, late 60s, Chef Air, what to do. Um, he's involved in the university occupations in Bologna, right? He actually participates in them. He, he occupies the university along with his students. Um, when the, uh, Negri and others were arrest, arrested on terrorist charges for their involvement, their so-called involvement within the Red Brigades. Man, Melandry is going to be a key advocate for them and push for uh, uh, their release, right? In 1983, he puts out a big article in that, in that realm. Uh, so what's more is that we can use uh, uh, Melandry's framework to understand the various paradoxes that tend to pervade Agamemnon's work, all right? So um, if, if you really take a step back and you look at the political formulations that Agamemnon's used, they're, they're really, they're really uh, uh, pushing on paradoxical formulations. And sometimes, you know, and this is the thing with working in all paradoxical formulations, we can either throw up our hands and be like, it is what it is, right? And sometimes we make, uh, we make mistakes because, you know, they're meant to kind of throw our mind in the loops. But Melandry gives us tools to work through these, and these can have a practical implication. So, for example, um, as you all know, Aristotle's modal ontology, right, his distinction between potentiality and actuality, is going to be the basis of most of Agamemnon's political thought, right? And why does uh, Aristotle make this distinction? in uh, antiquity between potentiality and actuality, but it's to overcome the paradoxes between uh, the paradoxes of change that Zeno and Parmenides brought to the fore, all right? So in a way you can think of it like this, um, you know, if Aristotle distinguishes between potentiality and actuality in order to overcome certain paradoxes, right, of change and stability, Agamemnon is gonna reinsert them by emphasizing pure potentiality. All right. And there are times where I do think Agamemnon can be a little bit more rigorous in his formulations of pure potentiality. And in the paper and the SAQ that's coming out, uh, I'm going to talk about that a lot more. All right. Um, another way we can think about this as well is that uh, um, Cavazzini, Andrea Cavazzini, is uh, one of the few scholars on Melandry who is a little more well known. And, you know, he argues that this kind of rigid understanding of logic and ontology, the systematic uh, ele like elemental atomistic understanding of logic and ontology goes hand in hand with what Weber would call the rationalization of politics and economics, right? And in the same way that uh, this rationalization in the fields of politics and economics leads to an emphasis on regularities, right? And uh, the relationship of means and ends um, independently of the question of the meaning of the means, right? Um, shifting this back into a kind of uh, uh, analogical way of thinking allows us to then take on means in a different, more paradoxical way, in a different, more significant way as well, okay? So um, let's take this example of, of what I mean, right? So a pure means is a very paradoxical notion, all right? And I have this uh, Benjamin quote up here. Benjamin quotes in the critique of violence. He says, a pure means is a kind of violence that definitely could not be either justified or an unjustified means to those ends, and would instead relate to those be to not as a means at all, but somehow differently. All right, and it's hard to conceive of a means without an end, right? 
Uh, it's so difficult to conceive of a means without an end that it may be a paradox con to conceive of a pure means, to conceive of a means without an end. And Agamemnon tends to differ, dither here about this, right? And how does he dither here? He tends to dither here about this in the way that sometimes, for example, if you look in State of Exception and 2004 State of Exception, he wants to insist that a pure means involves action, right? And other times when he discusses pure means, uh, Agamemnon will say that, you know, there's no action involved in a pure means, that it's a pure potentiality, that's a complete holding back of any actuality or activity, all right? Um, and this is because it's so hard for us to wrap our head around a pure means as a paradoxical notion. Um, next, if we look in Kant's definition, and this is playing in the background a lot in both uh, in Benjamin's critique, uh, in a lot of ways, which I want to point out, is that he's going to define a means as what contains merely a ground of the possibility of action, the effect of which is it ends is called a means, all right? So in his definition of a means, action is implicit and ends are implicit, right? So to, to, to pull the ends and action out of it, we become a part, we, we get tied up in the realm of paradox. And I think Benjamin is very aware of this when, he, uh, when he's relying on Kant in his uh, uh, in his critique of violence when he speaks of the police right as the first time where uh, law making and law preserving violence blend in each other I, I can't he, I can't but not hear the part of the schematism in the first critique right the, uh, the the paradoxes of judgment that occur there and then you know the entire third critique where you know we're just totally in the realm of the paradox of judgment, all right? So, and it's no uh, uh, coincidence that when Kant has to deal with the paradoxes of judgment, he goes right back to paradigms and examples, right? Uh, these are all kind of intertied things. So uh, to close, you know, what I wanna say is that, you know, sometimes when we have these kind of very practical uh, debates and discussions and disagreements about what it is for a pure means to unfold, what it is for there to be a means without ends. A lot of times this disagreement is a consequence of it being a, such a paradoxical concept. And one of the reasons why Melandry is so important is that he can help us deal with these paradoxical concepts with an additional amount of rigor and depth. Thank you. Excellent, Idris. Thank you so much for for such a substantive and, and great presentation on, on this thinker. And of course, there's a lot to say, and, and I think we, we can open the, the conversation and the debate. I myself have, have some questions, but, um, but for now, I would prefer for, for some of the participants to, to jump in and, and say something. No sé si hay alguna pregunta o comentario a partir de lo que, de lo que ha dicho Eh, Idris Robinson en su presentación. Hobo is to some degree comprehensible, you know. I know I gave you a lot of stuff there, so you know. Gerardo, can I try something? Yeah, please, Philip. Go ahead. Uh, Idris, thank you for the presentation. Um, hey, thanks for coming. Yeah, we need more stuff like that, a lot more, and we need it ur urgently. I mean, we need we need these discussion. Um, we need more of Melandry. I mean, I've been fighting with deep L and machine translation myself, and it's not super easy. But um, <laughs> you can tell by the accent. I, I, I switched to French, and it, I think it's better than switching to English. So oh. I, read, I read French and I translate Italian to French and it, it holds. Oh. Um, and I think also we need, at the very end, you, you did something great. We often tend to think of logic on one hand, like crazy discussion about, about Barbara and stuff like that, and politics on the other hand, right? We need to bring them together at some point. And I think that's happening. You, you, you said it a couple of times. Of course, the, the only reason I know about Belandry is because of uh, Agamben, okay? Mm -hmm. But there is almost nothing aside from Signatura Rerum where it's explicit. The commentators have not picked up on that. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to, I could, I could go on because really there's a lot to say and there's a key there. I feel there's a key to move forward, not only uh, in, in logic and philosophy, but in politics as well, or beyond politics. Maybe that's something we can talk about. 
I have the feeling I'm sharing that with you and maybe you can tell me I've been fighting I want to publish just a couple of notes about the the systemic and endemic misunderstanding of the relationship between bare life Zoe and bios yes. most of the time when I when I hear something people trying to summarize including folks like Derrida for instance yes. right yeah. They will, they will completely miss the fact that Agamben is, is not working from classic logic. So the temptation is usually to collapse, for instance, bare life on Zoe, and then to regain a classic binary opposition, and then to blame Agamben for creating a false dichotomy and a false division. But right. they, cannot, they cannot sustain the analogical relationship between bare life, Zoe, and Bias. So if you have any comments, I would be super happy to, to hear about it. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, uh, uh, I, th I think you're talking about in um, uh, the the lectures in the Beast and the Sovereign, right, where Derrida makes this mistake, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the one, you know, of course, the big hurdle, first off, and I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Negri does this well, is to think that, you know, uh, um, that within us is this bear kind of Zoe that can be pulled out in this way that's like the, the substrate, right? And that's the first mistake that tends to be made, right? Whereas uh, bear life is something that's produced, right? Uh, um, and it's produced in a very paradoxical way where, you know, in order for, you know, you begin within the polis, we begin within the city, we begin within the state, and being pushed out on the contours of the state is what makes the bare life come to the fore, right? And, uh, uh, you know, and to get that down, I think, and, and I think it, the, the, the paradoxical notion itself of being on the one hand made within the city, but pushed out of the city, but paradoxically in this weird topology connected to the city always makes its commentators mess this up and can't wrap their head around it. Um, one thing I guess, and uh, and I'd like to, I'd say this is why I'd like to read your paper is that you know it seems like in Agamben, you know, bare life is the subject par excellence to some degree, right? Uh, but you know, I'd like for someone to really explain, you know, if you know, bare life is produced through the model of exception, right? An example is produced via the model of, uh, I'm sorry, in whatever singularity is produced. Through the model of the example, right? On the one hand, right, bare life is produced by uh, taking what was inside and moving it to the outside, but keeping connection. And the example is produced by what was in the outside, using that to center the inside, right? How are these connected, and what does that mean for practical politics, right? And I think they have two. They they have a lot of similarities, right? In the sense that uh, um, with bare life, we have the Musulmaner, and we have the figure of the uh, um, the Musulmaner, and um, uh, um, what's the and Bartleby, right? And then in an example, in whatever singularity, we have the Tiananmen, Tiananmen protesters. And how do we logically get these two things? How do we understand the relationship between the two? Do they cross over, overlap? But I hope that gets out a little bit what you're saying. I'm, in a lot of ways, I just think these are open problems that need to be worked at. Yeah, if I can add two things mm -hmm. really quickly. I think bare life is not just produce, and, and that's amazing too. It's achieved. In, in Agamben, sometimes bare life is a good thing. Right? Yes, yes, yes. And it's, we talked about this with Gerardo. It's a uh, Gerardo, concepto bivalente. <laughs> I'm trying to learn Spanish a little bit. It's, it's kind of a, a concept intention, right? The same thing with the gesture in Agamben. Sometimes a good thing, sometimes a bad thing. Right. Maybe just to allow you to maybe develop on morphology, there, there would be a way to think about Zoe as the matter and Bios as the form, right? And you can extract like pure matter out of the form of Bios, which is like an informed form of life, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But I'm thinking that going, and that's that's Aristotle uh, ilomorphic scheme, right? Yes. The, the articulation of, of form and, ma and matter. But right. following what you said, following Meland Melandry, I'm thinking that Melandry discover or propose a way like many other authors, I was talking about Simondon, I think Simondon did that too, a way to move beyond the classical illomorphic scheme where you separate the form on one side and the matter on the other side. Yes. That's, that, that's all I wanted. That, that's 100% right, right? And, and one has to do with um, that, like I think for 
like, uh, and I, I don't want to put this in an, into uh, Melanchie's mouth, but with Agamben, I do feel this, and you know, and with the readers, uh, with Goethe and Wittgenstein, I try to read them in the way that's doing this underground current of Platonism, right? So it will, even though we take, uh, even though we might start with the hylomorphism, it's definitely going to be a problemization of this, right? And but with uh, Melandry specifically, one of the important parts of uh, analogy is that analogies are not purely formal, right? Um, you can have an analogy based on, say, structural components, right? Uh, but you can also have an analogy based on the content of the things, right? And, you know, at least when I, when I teach critical thinking and reasoning, I always tell my students, like, what makes the analogy always stronger in analogical reasoning is to have formal and, uh, and material similarities there, right? So I think you're 100% right about that, for sure. No, this is this is excellent, and uh, if one were to to extend all of these threads, it would be it would be a very long and 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 it's very interesting, important discussion. But uh, let me just add three points, and maybe the last point will be a sort of provocation to see what you would say. But also, I, I would tie this to to the last presentation that we had last week with uh, with Federico de la Sala's essay, which I thought it was great because you know to condense it. Although I will send the paper to you. Uh, his main claim was that Italian theory um, from, you know, what we take up as Italian theory from the 16th onwards has been a sort of um, defense of conflict. And you could say the linear paradigm against uh, any uh, cl closing off any possibility of, of revolution or, well, he ends up defending, the, 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 well, in quote unquote, defending or um, Saying that destitution is a way out of out of out of this uh, sort of setback. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is the first point I want to make. I think it's very interesting, um, and and it will be consistent with what Federico was saying last week. That you know the way that you started with this Agamben mini canon about Italian thinkers that really bring up or advance new 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 thought. Uh, you could say in 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 the wake of the collapse of of modern metaphysics is very. Is very interesting because none of those thinkers are thinkers that that we situate and we put in the list of the the so-called critical theories of, of Italian theory. They do right. something else, right? And, and the only one that I think is missing there, and this 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 I will link to the last to the last point I want to make, is Carlo Diano. I think we have talked about him in the past. The, this this great uh, classicist who who wrote a little book even before the last publication of Logic and Sense. Uh, uh, forma ad evento, no? uh, form an event. Oh. Um, so that would be my first point. My, my second point is, and I don't know. Diano, Diano, Diano. Yeah, Diano, yeah, Diano. Okay. Uh, it has been just translated in Forham um, oh. in the in the series of, of Italian Italian commonalities. Wow. Um, the, the second point is that the, the very interesting that you bring up bring up Geta. Uh, and I would say about that, maybe two things. One is that, that perhaps, perhaps the question of, of both means and morphology is that there is a, maybe a, a, a bad use, right? Or an extractive use of, uh, of both means and morphology once you uh, abuse them, right? Just to play on this, on, this, uh, on this game between use and abuse, you abuse them to, to get some kind of, a, extractive epistemology so it's very it's very telling that in the in the new agamben book on her the link get it it doesn't have a good um huh. a good standing there huh. Interesting. And, and and the way that i read it is that for agamben perhaps agamben wants to remind us that um well yes uh get uh, get is uh is great to be read, let's say, in the theory of colors, but that's still in a specific sort of epistemological domain huh. that subordinates, you know, life itself or even naked life to, huh. to, to this practice. Uh, whereas Herderling, that you could see that, or at least that's the vulgar understanding of Herderling, flights from the world, right? Uh -huh. is the, it is able to imagine, right? a life, a, a model life that 
um, that is not just that, that is not just an epistemological um, domain, right? It's really something in which, right? It's transformative at the level of, of life itself. I was just thinking of that because it's very it's very interesting and funny in a way how in the new Herdenling book, the life the chronicle of the life of Herdenling is on one side and and the life the diplomatic life of of uh, of Goethe meeting with Napoleon, yes, yeah. uh, right? Uh, talking to Hegel, it, yeah. it's considered the opposite, right? Right, right. Well, so, I guess, then, but, sorry, yeah. go on. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, well, Herlin went mad, right? And that is the best thing you could do in, 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 in the eyes of someone who wants to go for bare life, right? But keep going. Yeah, well, now that you mention it, perhaps, and, and I'm only thinking of this thanks, thanks to your presentation, but perhaps the madness of hurdling is precisely the madness of a life that tries to take up in a serious way, in an existential way, the problem of analogy, mm -hmm. right? Whereas one could say that Goethe reduced it to the problem of, you know, of visuality, let's say, right? Of a specular, a specular epistemology. Um, but but then this this final final the final thing this will be my question right uh, I I wonder what you what you think about this right if we were to extrapolate or try to start thinking because I think it's just beginning to try thinking of Melandris uh, which you you did a, a great job to to get us started on this uh, to to see Melandris imprint uh, or influx into Agamben's method. I wonder where, where if you see that this is correct, that perhaps what analogy offers is something is something like the like an infrastructure for an archaeological method, yes. and this means something like something like this: to not sacrifice neither history nor logic, but leaving out but leaving out historical necessity, right, and leaving out a a, a big problem which we have also been talking with Philippe and other, other colleagues, leaving out the question of natural law, which is the question of ends too. So I think the, the important here is, in, is, is tremendous. A, a third way that is neither about the natural law of ends mm -hmm. and, or historical necessity, right? Of individual autonomy, of the philosophy of history, et cetera. But then this will be my question to you is, so, what does this mean for revolution? <laughs> does, <laughs> does, good, good, good. Does this mean does this mean that precisely revolution, as it has been has been understood, has to be reworked fundamentally, even to the point of being um, one one would have to give it up. Because it seems to me, and again, this is just a, this is just a thought. It seems to me that, that, for instance, revolution has been precisely thought in these two registers that I was that I was saying, right? So, for instance, Saint Jude has, I think, a natural law definition of revolution. That's why he was against the social contract of Rousseau, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, claim natural law to go against the king and the old um, pre-revolution pre legitimacy. But then the modern revolution is a, is a revolution of ends, right? Of occupying the, the winter palace. Yes, yeah. That's the, that's the Leninist revolution, right? So I, I'm just stuck here, you know, and this is something that we, we talked with Federico because Federico de la Sala's paper finished with this, that mm -hmm. uh, we have to think well, in light of uh, Marcello Tari's book, which we have also discussed, that we have to think of a, 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 an unhappy, a, a happy uh, revolution, not unhappy revolution. Um, but the, my question is, 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 this revol is this still a revolution? Mm -hmm. I mean, or, 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 is it, or is it something else? Or is it something else previously? That is, if we take analogy, um, it seems to me that it could have profound transformation for the concept that we have inherited of revolution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Something like that, you know? Right. Um, 
And, and precisely here, I think that the question of the event, that's, another, that's an, a, a parallel question that I, would, that I have here for you, right? Whether uh -huh. you think that the analogy opens things up for, um, for the, precisely for the notion of, of, of the event, right? Um, and here one can trace it to, you know, to the Tiano uh, little book and stoicism, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, uh, I'll leave it here. All right, that, that's a hard question. <laughs> that's a very difficult question. You know, Gerardo, Gerardo is, uh, 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 I, I think, one of the most well-read and strongest interpreters of text. So this is a lot to, to get at. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to avoid the question for one second and say that going back to what uh, Philippe said, uh, I should also plug my, and I think it's one of my favorite books, uh, is The Politics of Logic by um, Paul Livingston, who's my advisor, he's my current doctoral advisor. Uh, and, um, you know, it's very much, it's called, it's the, the, the subtitle is uh, Wittgenstein and Badu on like the politics of logic or something like that. And, um, uh, you know, he deals with the Gambin there. And what, uh, one of his main claims is that logic itself is inherently political and politics itself is inherently logical, right? Whenever you have uh, ideas about grouping of, of humans or grouping of concepts, you know, you're, all, you're implicitly gonna punch on to logical problems. Uh, and I think he's done the best job so far of really taking this problem to task. And really what I see my work as, this kind of work is an expansion of his work. Um, now, uh, so let, let me go back and let me, so first let me go to, uh, Goethe and uh, Hertelin, right? Um, what's interesting, and, and I haven't read the Agamemnon book yet, so I, I can't I can't really comment on exactly how he's making this, uh, uh, how he's drawing this contrast between Hertelin and Goethe. But you know, on the one side, you'd think that Goethe would be a proponent of life to some degree, right? In the sense that you know, in, in his critique of Newton when he's working on color. You know, he says that, you know, Newton takes one case and that's going to be the case of white light. And he makes the, in, the case of white light is where he's going to draw his axioms and he's going to derive the rest of the theorems from that, right? And what Goethe instead does, and, you know, his, his aha moment with color was that, you know, he, he began to use the, the prism instead of just taking up the experiment in crucem, uh, the experiment in crucis of, uh, of Newton, he used it in a manifold of different ways and began to see that, you know, not everything, uh, everything, all the cases that he derived, or all the cases that he observed using the prism in different ways couldn't be accounted for strictly in terms of Newton's method. So he had to develop, uh, uh, you know, this morphological method to go through the different cases of light. And in fact, um, in the first, uh, in the first installment of the first, uh, or the first volume of his study of color, uh, he even hit a roadblock where he started to see that, you know, it had to incorporate you know, uh, um, human perception in order to get at all the different kinds of cases that he was going through, right? Um, so, you know, by, the, by the, the polished version of the work, a lot of it is gonna have to do with, you know, the manipulation of the user of the prism, you know, where the person is, how the person is looking. But the flip side of this is this, right? And this is more to your point, right? Is that, uh, when Wittgenstein does criticize Goethe, he's going to argue that he like he reifies these paradigms, right? He reifies the existence of the herb plant, or he reifies the existence of you know his various ways of using light and dark to derive colors, right? He thinks they actually exist, right? And what Wittgenstein wants to say, and I'm still having fully worked this out, right, is that more than anything, that the What's in, what Goethe didn't realize and what he realizes is that when you use paradigms, say of color or of plants, et cetera, et cetera, they become paradigmatic because of the use of the particular person, right? You could take any leaf, right? And it has nothing to do with any particular quality of the leaf, right? Or any uh, 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 like uh, data coming from a prism, but it's how they relate to the different 
individual cases, right? So and that requires a human user to say, I'm using this thing as a paradigm, right? So in that way, you know, I, I could see uh, at least my uh, way of reading Wittgenstein to agree with the Gaumann, right? That the human user isn't fully in the center there, right? It's been the, the substance of the paradigms have been reified. Um, now for revolution, uh, I think it's a lot more difficult. And one, <laughs> one of the uh, uh, things, one of the uh, uh, one of the reasons why I felt this was a breath of fresh air is that you know whenever I say things politically, you know people will attack them in this and that way. But with you know logic, you can kind of show back and be like, let's think about this, right? So I haven't even really even I've never even really drawn out uh, the notion of how analogy would actually work with revolution itself, except that it would allow us to say understand fair life and uh, understand uh, uh, whatever singularity, but. Um, when you talk about means and, and means without ends and, uh, and means to an end, et cetera, et cetera, you know, I, I can't say anything more than uh, uh, probably what I did in the South in the South Atlantic Quarterly issue, right? And um, you know, what I argued there was that, and this is going to get a little bit away from analogy, but it will deal with the question of revolution, is that um, you know, in Agamben's reading of when he begins to speak of destituent power in the 2014 talk at the summer camp or at the, uh, or at the uh, symposium, the one uh, gladly translated by Stephanie Wakefield, um, he argues that you know, the West or modernity is caught in this model of, is stuck in this model of revolution and counter-revolution, revolution that ends up right back at the same state or maybe even a worse state and he's, theorizing constituent power to get away from it. Now, if you look at uh, what I argue is that when you read the critique of violence from Benjamin and his reading the critique of violence from Benjamin, he can't square the two, right? Uh, Wittgenstein, I'm sorry, Benjamin uses the term revolution, he uses insurrection, he uses anarchy, right? He uses all these synonyms to describe what he means by pure divine violence, right? And in my text, what I argue is that uh, um, what's going on here is that there are two ways we can understand a means without an end, right? Uh, on the one hand, you can have a purely passive form of a means without an end, right? Which would not look like a revolution, all right? And this would be, this would be something like Agamemnon's pure potentiality where it's the lack of activity that makes it a kind of means without end, right? You're not doing anything, therefore you can't have an end, right? Uh, I call this kind of a desertion strategy where you know you pull out and in practical terms where you pull back, it's an evasion, a kind of strategy, a strategy of desertion. And you can see this in some of Agamemnon's work in uh, on like uh, on on monastic traditions, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see this in today, right? I think Occupy was using that strategy, this kind of pull, this desertion, evasion strategy. Um, uh, I say that, you know, uh, with Tahir Square in 2011, right? You have um, people taking the square as kind of this manifestation of pure potentiality, but not actually doing anything. They're just, they're just standing within a square. Tiananmen Square, the students, right? are another version of that. Now on the flip side, um, and this is the kind of uh, um, paradox within, uh, the paradox will pull within means without end or pure potentiality is that there's also ways we can conceive of a pure potentiality or means without end that involves action, right? And this in the practical terms would look like instead of, uh, you know, the very middle class, maybe um, uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood people who took up the square into here, on the flip side, you have the Port Said rioters in, uh, uh, who are very active hooligans, you know, um, Ahali hooligans who are attacking the police. Or instead of Occupy, we have um, the Ferguson uprising or, or what happened in 2020, which is very active in destruction, um, active and destructive. Or um, I contrast on the one hand, the desertion of the students in the square in the Tiananmen, with on the flip side, you have the more active combatant nature of the workers, right? The workers' federations in uh, that fought outside the square that took on the tanks, right? And so you'll have a version of a means without ends that doesn't have an end, but involves activity. The only activity that can mean is destruction in order for it not to devolve into a constituent constituted process. 
right? And that looks a lot more like revolution, right? It's the destruction, the destructive side of revolution without the building of the new society after, right? And then on the other hand, you have this, uh, you have this kind of desertion strategy that is typically of the middle class and where the, the, the lumpen kind of more proletarian elements do the more destructive strategy and the middle classes do the more evasive strategy. And I think the problem of revolution today is how to square this classic kind of revolutionary destruction with the evasion that we see of the middle class elements. That might not have answered your question though. <laughs> No, no, yeah, yeah. That's precisely the point, I think, because um, be, because again, the the in political terms, I think that mm -hmm. right. Another way of saying the 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 modern revolution of ends, it would be saying the 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 the, the constituent power element, right? Driving mm -hmm. driving the same mechanism of uh, of occupying power. Yes. At the same time. At the same time, if, if I can add one more thing, and, yeah, and then, I don't know if anyone has something else to, to say, of course, you, you're welcome to jump in. But it's interesting, right, that, um, and this might have something to do with what you claim that is very interesting, uh, that a subterranean pla Platonism mm -hmm. or another form of Plato, I think that has to do with the same question of the of ends or the, the, the so-called natural law problem, um, that Agamben is exploring his recent, in his, in his latest book, is about realization. He's, he's against realization. Yes. But in, in, in English, we don't use this, more in Italian and Spanish, right? Re realizado, bring to an oh. end, right? Same. But, but he wants to defend Plato uh, uh, as, as someone who precisely is, is on the melandry side, in a way, yes. not, not necessarily exhausted on, on realizable and mm -hmm. but it's interesting right that at the end of the uses of the body he brings up this figure of the nocturnal council yes which it seems to me and if i want to be a little bit polemical please uh, i would say i would say perhaps the nocturnal council is something like a a mild legislative power of means because i think agamben is also worried that one of the mechanisms of, of power is precisely the, the, the optimization of the anarchy of power, something like that. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm always been interested in, in the play, in the, in the way that that figure enters there, because it seems to me that, that and I have asked people who are in, the, in philosophy of law, they have said, well, at least in the conventional reading is that the nocturnal council in Plato, in Plato's law, is uh, it's like a guardian of the constitution. Hmm. Of course, Agamben can, would not want to use it like that. So, yeah. But, but yeah. still, it, it cannot be, um, it seems to me, right? If, if there has to be a political sort of, as, as he says, uh, following Plato, a sort of uh, new common for us to be, to, for us to last together, mm -hmm. you don't want, let's say fascist to, to occupy that, um, that center, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this is a difficulty here, I think, uh, in terms of the political eff efficacy. Um, that, that's why, that's why, I mean, I think that, that this figure in Plato um, mm -hmm. administer something else that, for instance, messianism can, does not, it seems to me. Right, um, right. But, Again, this this is just a, a way of just thinking aloud with what you say. Yeah, and 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 that, that that's the tricky part about that last paragraph in the use of bodies, right? In the in the um, what is it? Not the pro. It, it's the 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 afterword, right? On constitutional right. power, is that um he uh, uh you know he posits this thing of uh of uh, a nocturnal council, but when he posits it, you might notice that he says that like. I don't have the resources or the time or you know the power now to speak about uh, what a constituent actuality would be, right? And then he's like, it would be actualized within uh, uh, this council to some degree, right? And you know, and we're left saying like, what does that mean, right? Um, uh, what I want to say, what what I think is going on, and maybe and he he probably maybe hopefully. When he's like, all right, you just let me tell you what time it really is. But what seems to me is going on is that 
it, that's this tension between understanding the two ways of actuality that I talked about, right? Where there's an another way you can put this is that in the distinction between potentiality and actuality, right? There's actuality that is the realization of a particular thing and there's actuality as the act, right? So, and in both of these ways show up in Aristotle, right? And it seems that sometimes that Agamben wants to say, you know, I want to resist actuality as the realization of a thing, because that would become the state, right? And in doing so, he runs together this with, I want to resist actual activity, right? And, uh, you know, uh, playing on this twofold kind of understanding of actuality, I think maybe is where, uh, why he has to resort to something like that, right? Whereas I want to say that both, if, if we take into account both constituent strategies uh, that can, one can involve act and one does not involve act, we can maybe understand this, we can understand this uh, without having to move on to another book maybe, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if there are other questions or comments. I think we have maybe uh, four or five minutes more until we close. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I would just add, right, that I, I asked Agamben this question. Um, yeah, oh, great, great, great. About, about whether the Nocturnal Council is, it could be taken, um, could be taken as an institution, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which, which is an interesting problem by itself and not, if, if only interesting if I'm able to isolate institution from from let's say the metaphysics of government, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, but but he said but 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 he was he was not too happy and he didn't agree with this. So he responded to me, um, and, and I'll just try to translate it here from the uh, from the Spanish version that I have in the book. He said that uh, to to institute a decision power is a contradiction in terms. Oh. This, this was back in 2007, 17 or 16, maybe. So he, he was already sort of uh, going against Esposito, most recent attempt to, to create a new institution, institute, instituent power, right? Yes. Um, and he says Plato, um, Plato is very careful uh, to, to establish that the Nocturnal Council cannot establish itself legally. So it's not a figure of law mm. since it has been created by, by a, and here's another Plato, Platonic figure, right? But by a, a broad synosia, which is lasting, lasting together in common or lasting together, uh, something like that. Uh, the problem that we have to think here is the, is the relation or the communal relation well, I think a relation between more than one person, right? The common relation um, between a anomic element or or anarchic element and a and a nomic or legal institutional element, but the possibility of a of a just politics depends on this, and this is interesting. I think this is. I don't know what you think about this um this meta this aesthetic metaphor here, mm -hmm. uh, since you talk about color. But he says the possibility of a just politics depends on a dial on this di musical dialectic between these two elements, mm. M musical dialectic. Mm. Um, so of course, I think that the the I think that's that's very interesting there that he's not positing you know the idea of of just or extra legality right. in, in any sort of uh, natural law domain. Because if it does, then we'll be in the same problem. In a way, since we're here in the United States, that's what the Supreme Court of the United States has done. <laughs> in all, in all yeah. these cases, right? They, ha they haven't respected, they haven't respected a written law and uh -huh. they have just gone to, to um, the broad common law that is just, which is, what, which is what the Nazis actually admire about American law. There is a great Gosh. James Whitman book called Hitler's American Model. Uh -huh. which is that in the 1930s, the, the Nazis jurists, what they like about American law was not positivism. It was this big, broad common law uh, paradigms that would allow, allow them to be racist or exclude uh, others, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, so 
I think, I think, uh, I think the fight to put it in, in more militant terms, no, the fight for Platonism is very important. <laughs> yeah, it is. Sure, sure. And and you know, like I never, you know, people ask like, are you a, a Marxist or anarchist or a socialist? You know, I typically just say I'm a Platonist, right? And 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 uh, <laughs> that's a. Uh, uh, <laughs> how I usually would describe myself, right? Um, you know, like, and the two thinkers who, you know, I always will go back to are Wittgenstein and Plato. Um, you know, I, I was thinking as well, one other thing to be mentioned is that if you look at the end of the first chapter of the signature of all things, he references a dissertation on, uh, on Gerthian paradigms by, you know, which is really amazing, a, 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 a woman philosopher, I think her last name is Rotten from like 1901, right? And it's also trying to trace- What's her, what's her last name? I think it's Rotten, I'm not sure. Rotten maybe, Rota, you know, something like this. Yeah, you have to excuse all my harsh American pronunciations of everything, right? But um, it's on like uh, this platonic trend of paradigms, you know, and uh, it's maybe like the last line of the first or the last, section of the, of the first chapter of Signature All Things, right? Um, another interesting way I think you could look at it is that, and, um, and one place I do think Agamemnon is just totally on point is in um, uh, his article, his essay, The Thing in Itself, where he reads Plato's Seventh Letter, which is you know, a beautiful essay, it's a beautiful letter. I still give it to my, I give that to my students every year. Um, and uh, you, know, you get this, uh, figure of Plato as an activist, right? And if I recall in the use of bodies, he cites um, the back and forth between Hadot and Foucault on what Plato's politics looks like, where, Plato, where uh, Foucault begins to speak about uh, what he sees as a use of the self in terms of uh, what we gather from Plato, right? And I think it's an open question that I would love to work, go through, you know, in more detail, you know. Plato definitely had a, a, a revolutionary side to him, I believe, right? At least that's how I want to make him be understood, you know. And of course, there is a, there is a contemporary writing, uh, re rewriting of, of Plato's Republic by, by, by Badu. Yeah. Uh, I also make my students read that. <laughs> They got a lot of Plato in my in my course. Bueno, no, no sé si hay otra pregunta o comentario para para eh, Idris a partir de lo que ha dicho o lo vamos cerrando aquí. Felipe, anything else that you want to add, or if not, we can just maybe um, leave it up here. Yeah. No, otherwise, this could. This could go on for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Weeks. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay, Idris, thank you again very much hey, for this very, much. very, very good and rich presentation. Yeah. Uh, and thank for you. everyone who who was here today as well. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Philippe.